Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 98. I'm Heidi Sigmund Kuda. Today, Jim Hi-Fi and I are going to be interviewing investigative reporter Ken Silverstein, who just broke a bombshell story about military contractor Eric Prince and his group chat. And what Ken describes to us is a group of hundreds of extremists who go from extreme right all the way to fascism. Have a listen. Ken, we are so happy that you are with us this morning. Um, I just want a a full disclosure. I have never received more DMs or more messages from members of uh, my community and various networks that I'm attached to. And when this story dropped, everybody read it. Everybody was so excited about it. And of course, the story that we're talking about off leash inside the secret global far right group chat. And can you just get us kicked off on why uh, you haven't had a second to breathe since you dropped this story? I haven't had much time to breathe because I'm very happy to say that I also have received a whole lot of, of feedback from the story and it's done very well and it seems to be just still uh, kicking around the internets and, uh, and, and attracting attention. And I'll be writing a number of other stories. I will be writing about this for weeks, no doubt, because I was only able to use a fraction of the information I, I had. I was hoping to publish a piece before I got on, uh, but it's going to have to be a little, hopefully within the next hour and a half or two hours, with the names of 20 more people who I haven't previously revealed who are either they were either invited to the group and most of them were actually active participants in the group. So yeah, I've been real busy and I've been getting invited onto a number of podcasts and to do interviews, other types of interviews and it's all good, but I'm just, (laughs) I'm swamped. So yeah. That's great news. High five. You go. Thank you. So one thing I'd like to know is you now have access to Eric Prince's WhatsApp Uh, You have all these people in this group. It sounds like they are radicalizing themselves in this chat. But my question for you is, do you feel that anything you saw in this group chat rises to a level of criminality that concerns you such that you should you feel you should contact law enforcement about it? No, because. I mean, the, the, there's discussion of uh, arms deals to Israel. Three of, and I'll be writing about this within the next couple of days. Three people in the group uh, are arms brokers. And they, well, there are more than three who are arms brokers in the group, but three of the arms brokers make offers to a guy named Moti Kahana, <clears throat> who says he's, he's an Israeli American businessman, and he says he's an intermediary with the IDF. One of those deals was, I mean, I don't see any other way that it wasn't just flatly illegal because uh, there's a discussion of, you know, the weapons, uh, the, the the equipment can't be sent. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it can't go to Israel. So we'll have to go to another country uh with where you can get an end user certificate. I've written a lot about arms trafficking over the last 20 years. The minute I saw this, I'm like, okay, this doesn't look kosher. Um, you know, you, you, when you can't ship to a country, I don't know where the weapons are coming from. Okay. Because it's not clear from the conversation in, in this particular uh, offer to the guy who's the intermediary with your IDF. <clears throat> but so I don't know where the weapons would be coming from, but it's obvious that that country does not allow shipments of weapons to Israel because of the current conflict. And hence they need an end user certificate. So they, I'm making this up because they don't say where it's just stated explicitly. The weapons have to go somewhere else before they go to Israel. So I'm going to just pick Cyprus, which is roughly in the neighborhood. And then, you know, the the idea is you get an end user certificate that says Cyprus is buying these weapons. You get them to Cyprus. And from there, you know, hey, you pay off the necessary people at the port and in the government. And they allow the weapons to 
be shipped on to Israel because then, you know, Cyprus was never going to buy them. Uh, they were always intended for Israel, but they couldn't go there. So that to me is, I'm going to put that out because, uh, you know, it's something that I think should be brought to the attention of uh, who's ever, you know, like the State Department monitors exports, not that they've been really doing much in terms of uh, shipments to Israel. I mean, Biden signed off on everything, but nonetheless, this is not a legal deal as far as I can tell. If it is, then let them explain if anybody's interested in checking in with them. The things that were more alarming, it's not, it's not as if, you know, uh, and I would I wasn't really expecting that they'd be discussing like robbing banks or something like that. What's alarming about the group is that they talk about, you know, the only instrument of foreign policy that they're in favor of is military force, whether it's bombings, assassinations, covert operations, you know, regime change. That's, you know, that's, that's it. Like, in fact, one of the, a guy in the group who I call a dissident, who in any other context would be seen as ultra conservative, but in the context of off leash, this, you know, the Prince group chat, he, he looks like, you know, like, my God, he's like some, you know, a hippie with flowers at the Pentagon in 1968. <clears throat> so he says, um, he makes a joke about, you know, I'm worried about like the, there's a group that was formed a subset uh, that, you know, there was a discussion, you know, we had, we, the conversation is getting too hot here for WhatsApp. So we might want to move it to this more private place, you know, um, and so he's joking about those people and he says, you know, I'm worried that their list of uh, countries to invade is now up to about 50 or something like this. Um, so even for, there aren't many of these, what I'm labeling dissidents in the group, there are a few, but whenever they raise concerns like this, you know, it's basically they're shouted down by everybody else. I mean, all they want to do is bomb, invade, overthrow. And then they also very explicitly talk about the need to crack down on their domestic enemies in ways that are quite alarming, you know, our, our uh, uh, internal foes, you know, enemies of the country. You know, there's talk of like a Nuremberg style tribunal. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I find that alarming. You know, it's, the group, it's not that these are people who are, who are, you know, their views are known to some extent, but because they thought their conversation was private, they, I think it's fair to say they speak more openly and honestly about their real aims. And that's alarming. I'm not a fan of the Biden administration. And personally, I'm not going to vote in the election because it's, I'm in DC. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, you know, it matters if you're in Michigan or Florida or whatever, but you know, I'm not a fan of either party, but, you know, in terms of the threat posed by Trump, uh, the, th the threat to domestic repression, in my opinion, you know, Trump is clearly a, a, a far greater danger than Biden. And I don't want to over hype or exaggerate the influence of these people, but they are influential. They're not just a bunch of cranks. I mean, Eric Prince is, uh, you know, uh, in my opinion, there are people in this group who, like Prince, who are capable of impacting policy and causing damage and harm, more, more ability than some of the, like, two current members of Congress in the group or current government officials who are in the group. I think Prince may be more influential than these feet than, than the current officials and a number of others in the group are too, because as private citizens or representatives of political parties of, of abroad as well. So private and in their private and public roles, these people have inf influence and they are linked to broader right-wing networks. And I, again, I don't want to exaggerate. It's not like this is, you know, like, you know, the group of people who are pulling the strings of global affairs, but they are not without influence. They're not just harmless cranks and they're dangerous in many ways. And I, I, I would like to, <clears throat> I would like to reference what you said about that arms deal, because if you feel that arms deal is illegal, I would like to, you know, remind you that Eric Prince just beat charges in Austria questionably 
uh, violations of the War Materials Act. I mean, this is a man who is, you know, they're enabling the selling of bullets and rockets and planes and whatnot around the world and causing violence around the world. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question about it. And this is what I mean. They're not they're, they're not just blowing off steam. They are blowing off steam to a certain extent, but they're in blowing off steam. They're revealing their aspirations and <clears throat> goals and beliefs. And those beliefs can be quite scary. And beyond that, as I said, they're not, you know, they're people who are uh, uh, they have the ability. Many of them have the ability to get things done and not good things. And so yeah. they are talking in the group about arms deals. Now, I don't, you know, Prince is not involved in the conversation about the arms deal. So I'm not sure, uh, you know, whether he would personally be culpable, you know, but the, the people in the group, and it's not clear uh, that every deal would be illegal. It's the one deal that I have talked to experts about it. I'm a minor expert. I will modestly say about arms trafficking because I've written about it for a quarter century. <laughs> there, I don't see, I mean, I don't see an explanation that would make this a legal deal. Um, you know, because you're, there's an acknowledgement. We can't send to Israel. We have to send somewhere else. Right. And that means that they're going to get a bogus end user certificate. So yeah, I mean that I've mentioned that story, uh, and I'm going to be publishing details about it. So Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Jim, you go ahead and jump in. Um, yeah. Um, first, let, we're, we'll agree to disagree on not voting in this election. Um, I personally think that it's important everybody does regardless, um, just because we do agree that, that uh, a potential Trump administration brings a lot of danger. Um, including Eric Prince, who said that he wants to be viceroy of deportation <laughs> because that's what they called him in Afghanistan. Um, he's uh, a scary man. I'm very curious about what you said about domestic enemies, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, he is, it's been reported in, you know, the New York Times that he trains operatives. Project Veritas operatives and other mm -hmm. uh, sorts of uh, people to infiltrate um, uh, domestic groups on the left, generally. Um, I'm mm -hmm. curious if you saw any of that sort of Project Veritas targeting kind of activity in these chats. I, <laughs> I'm working on a piece about that because I'm trying to sort of put things together. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, someone from Project Veritas in the group. I don't want to mention the person's name now because I'm still trying to figure out <clears throat> certain things about their involvement. But I will say it's it's somebody who broke with O'Keefe and they're no longer friendly. Um, and uh, But to me, um, uh, there's things in the group chat combined with other information that leads me to believe that, um, uh, you know, we know Prince has collaborated with, with Veritas. And I just from piecing things together, and I think I can make a convincing case uh, uh, because I don't have the argument, I, I don't have the evidence to act, to prove this flat out, but that chronology is real persuasive. I think that Project Veritas was working with Prince uh, with very, very uh, targeted purposes. Um, I mean, the thing is, like, Eric Prince is not a great, like, whatever one thinks of Project Veritas, uh, uh, it, you know, he's not a big fan of journalism, even if what Project Veritas does is not always journalism. I mean, I'm just saying that because I think, I mean, I guess a guy like O'Keefe, he would be, <clears throat> you know, entirely comfortable and trusting of because he's not going to, you know, stray off the reservation. But nonetheless, I believe that uh, uh, 
I, I'm sorry. I just want to be a little careful. But I promise I will send you the story because it won't be long, but it'll probably be next week because I still need to piece things together. There's one really interesting case that uh, I think uh, they worked on a, a, a project that uh, was... I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, so I'll just say shady AF. Just a, a uh, follow-up, because just because I have to, because of my personal uh, situation. Yeah. Um, is there anything you tell us about anything Mike Flynn might have said in these messages? Um, I there's not a lot I can say now, but the, like there are, he's he's there are other people who 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 comment more. I would have yep. to go back through it again. He does say some interesting things. I mean, but, you know, there, like there was one sort of Lord of the Rings moment where there's a big fight in the group uh, uh, between Flynn and somebody else, which like got a little much for me. It didn't seem that interesting, but it could be more interesting to you. There And, and there are other things that, you know, warrant as outrageous or scary or whatever as some of the other stuff I saw. I mean, so I really would have to think about it. He does interject from time to time. As I said, he's not one of the most frequent. I mean, right. he talks about, uh, you know, I mean, he's in this, like, you know, the, the political spectrum in this group starts on the extreme right, which is <laughs> on the left. <laughs> and then it moves to flat out fascism. I mean, totally. and he, you know, he's closer to that, you know, because it's with, yeah. with Flynn, it's sort of, I mean, there's like a craziness also that, you know, like, I don't think he's, although, you know, hey, Laura Logan is in the group and she's completely well, off the rails. Well, Laura Logan works for him. Exactly. Laura Logan works at America's Future, which all they do is pizza gate <laughs> yeah no no i know it's right so, 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 yeah. so those those worlds totally cross i was i was glad you put her in there but his very but his interjections are you know it's clear that he's you know he's m more towards the fascist spectrum than the moderates you know <laughs> yeah. as I said. Yeah. I mean, that's not a you know, one of the things that was sort of funny but i you know it's not like explosive but it was just more amusing in this case is that um you know when tucker carlson who's also in the group and rarely uh chimes in as well uh but he is in the group um uh, he did he does say like he's at, like he, at some point he said something he, he does uh, on a few occasions he says things okay. i a yeah i i actually believe have uh reason to believe that there are a number of people in the group <clears throat> who I know, and I don't know this about him, but I have enough indications that I think it's true, okay? There are people in the group who were like, this is going to blow. It's a big group. There are too many people, and I am like, I may monitor, I may... Uh, read from time to time, but I'm not saying anything that can get me in trouble because <clears throat> it's going to blow. And I'm almost sure he was in the, I, I would say no, literally 99%. I just can't say for certain other people I know because I've been told directly. Um, but like Flynn is, you know, when Tucker Carlson interviewed Putin in Russia, oh my God, it's just pathetic. I mean, like the entire group is like giving Tucker a tongue bath, and oh, yeah. oh my and, god! <laughs> and Flynn is so Flynn is one cringe. of the primary cheerleaders. It's like, yep. you know, Flynn basically says, and this story I am I'm going to post this like whenever I can finish it. Hopefully within the next hour and a half, <clears throat> I'll I'll mention this. Um, you know, Flynn is one of the big cheerleaders and talking about how it's the that it's the like he basically portrays it as one of the most important moments in modern journalism history. And then the entire group, I mean, tongue bath is, if I were talking privately, I would use another uh, uh, two word term uh, that's a little bit more evocative. 
but, but um, and and more accurate. But um, you know, hey, look, I don't want to say anything like that. So I'll just say, you know, never mind, never mind. I you know, I think you already said it. Get the right? point. I, yeah, I, I, know. I think you communicated just, what you needed to. <laughs> yeah, no, just, you already said it. Yeah, it's incredible though. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. Like, it's like you're grown men. Like, yeah. have some dignity, even if you yeah. think this is private. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I don't know. I, 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 Trump I have... worship also is like, you know, I don't know. Like, it's 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 like, a you know, it's not normal. Old? One of them, one of the guys, he's a retired army colonel. You know, posted to the group from the, you know, the CPAC in D.C. last in February. <clears throat> conservative political action uh, conference. And he he says, tears streaming down my face, DJT and the J6ers are in the house. That was like, John Mills, right? That was Colonel John Mills who worked. Yeah, John Mills used to work for him. Yeah, he used to work wow. for him. <laughs> so wow. it's like, again, like, I mean, I have strong political views and there are politicians who I strongly admire I've never been quite moved to tears. Uh, you know, it's just like, honestly, like this is like, I guess, the sort of loyalty Mussolini inspired. So, Thank you so Thanks. much for that. This is all so great. And I want to quote you back on something that alarmed me, uh, being German-American, is uh, near the front of your article, you have a quote, the West is at best a beautiful cemetery, lamented Sven von Storch whose aristocratic German family fled the country after World War II to Chile, where their son was raised before returning to the land of his ancestors, where he married the granddaughter of the Third Reich's last de facto head of state who was convicted at Nuremberg. It's like, you know, you talk about kind of some of the cult dynamics, but for me, that was just like, whoa, like literal Nazi adjacent people. And can you yes. speak a little bit about that? Because that was very <clears throat> unnerving. There were certain people in the group and like it took me quite a while to identify von Storch. And I, you know, there's no need to go into how, but it was frustrating because he post as S in the group and he, he wrote things that like, you know, it was evident, a hundred percent evident. He was a flat out fascist. There's no other way to describe it. And there are a couple of other people in the group. There's a, Romanian soldier of fortune, mercenary uh, named Horatio Potra. You know, another, like there's that European strand of fascism that is different than the U.S. far right. I, I mean, in some ways I'm like, I don't want to say, oh, the U.S. stuff is harmless. It's just that it's different. It's a European fascism is, uh, you, you could tell straight off these, these two and several others were, <clears throat> were fascist. And so I was like, yeah, that's I knew it was your recipe, right? I mean, that that those guys are are coming straight from the source. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I knew that S, which is what Von Storch, that's his handle. I knew this guy was bad news, but I couldn't figure out who it was. I knew he was German, and I knew he uh, had a connection to Chile, um, uh, and it, it, that's where his family fled after World War II. Pinochet, and, that whole thing, yeah. Was, he's yep. deeply enmeshed in the, you know, dregs of the Pinochet movement. And now he met with Bolsonaro in Brazil. I mean, the guy is like, <clears throat> you know, he's just a flat-out fascist and very, very scary. And But, it, you know, it's it's a, a funny is probably not the right word, but I'm like, okay, this guy is absolutely bad news. But, okay, even in my wildest nightmares, I was not expecting married to the granddaughter of the Third Reich's last de facto head of state who's tried at Nuremberg and sentenced to, to 10 years for financing the concentration camps and who was just one of the, you know, a, you know, a diehard Nazis. I mean, AFD, right? Yeah. And he, That's his wife is Beatrix, Henrietta who is a granddaughter, is a leader of that party, which is, I think, the most yeah. right wing of of Europe's far right parties, at least wow. the ones that are powerful. Absolutely. And then, and and von uh, von Storch, Sven von Storch is 
a you know a, a figure affiliated. He's con he, you know he's considered a figure, a prominent figure within the party, and he's like running around the world with you know Latin American fascist, and his views are just like the minute the minute I read it, it's like this guy is bad. But what? Not like it's not six degrees. It's it's really like one degree. It's the granddaughter of one of the most prominent figures in the third Reich. I mean, not the best known, but the last effective ruler of the, of that, the third that, Reich. That is an amazing bit of, of information, by the way. I want to pause on that. He literally ran the third Reich because Hitler and Goebbels had committed suicide. He was, well, what happened he was, was, yeah, you, I mean, that's, but it's actually slightly better or worse, depending on your perspective. Please, please. What happened is <clears throat> Hitler's, in Hitler's last will and testament, he appointed Goebbels to run the successor state because he was going to commit suicide. And then this guy, Ludwig von Kronigs or something, the you know, his finance minister for the entire time he was chancellor, uh, he's listed in the last will and testament. I'm not sure if he was the number two to Goebbels, but he was he he was either the number two or someone very, very important because, you know, hey, the, the Russian tanks are closing in on the Fuhrer's bunker. And, you know, he wants to make sure that the thousand year Reich is going to continue. Um, so it's got to be his most trusted people. And so this guy is one of the most trusted. And then Garibald's commits suicide with his entire family. Couldn't have yeah. happened to a nicer guy. Sorry. Yeah. And um and this guy, you know, becomes the, you know, he takes over as the last de facto head of state and he surrenders. But, you know, he was tried at Nuremberg and described as like, all, you know, throughout his time in government, just an ardent champion of the Nazis. This was not one of the, you know, guys who like had doubts. Uh, or, you know, he was when, when you moved to Chile after after World War II, you haven't given up anything. <laughs> right? So, oh, yeah. so yeah. what I That's also right. want to chime in and say is, uh, it is an astonishing piece of journalism too. An astonishing amount of work went into that, and I think you're right. How could they not expect with hundreds of people that there wouldn't be something that leaked? But honestly the investigations that you've done subsequently, and I look so forward to your future reports. Since our time is almost up here, I want you to tell our viewers who are global, uh, who may sort of understand who Prince is tangentially, why is this so explosive? And why, uh, why, and I'm very grateful that the response has been as strong as it is, but why do you think that, um, you know, this is kind of like igniting the world? Well, I mean, Prince is pretty notorious. I mean, mo most people who follow politics at all are familiar with him. You know, he's an influential figure. I mean, the founder of Blackwater, you know, which, you know, create like, I mean, there, there's, you know, there was the massacre in, in, two, I, North Square. I think it was 2000, yeah, in 2000, I think it was 2007 where Blackwater employees, <clears throat> you know, as killed, like, I, I don't remember the number of Iraqi civilians, but I believe it was a dozen or more. A lot of people were injured. You know, there's a guy in the group, Paul Slow, who was one of the people who was responsible for those murders. And he was convicted and sentenced and pardoned at the last minute uh, as Trump was out the door. He's in this group. And so is Peter Hexis, who is a was an advisor to Trump who uh, uh, who lobbied for all of the Blackwater killers to be released, and they were. <clears throat> but, um, you know, look, he founded Blackwater. He's been involved with a number of other private military contractors. He has connections around the world. You know, in the U U United Arab Emirates, he's like, he's been the mercenary of choice for the ruling family, protected their their, the family and their oil, the oil insul installations and <clears throat> and ran, you know, flown mercenaries into Yemen from Colombia uh, uh, as part of an operation. He supported their, you know, the Emirates foreign operations. Um, and so, you know, he's 
active there. Um, he's extremely closely connected in Israel. He went there after 10-7 to try to sell them on a project of his to flood <clears throat> Hamas's tunnels. Uh, and, uh, you know, the guy, in addition, so in addition to his private military experience and his involvement, you know, which, which ranges from De Democratic Republic of Congo to Belarus, he's been involved in a lot of nasty places, and he has close ties to right-wing governments in many parts of the world. But also, he was an informal advisor to Trump, extremely close and, you know, beloved in MAGA world. He is one of many people. This is why the group is dangerous, and it's not just a bunch of cranks or harmless cranks blowing off steam like our crazy uncles at the Thanksgiving dinner, you know. <clears throat> like, he... There are a lot of people in this group who could get positions in a second Trump administration. I don't think Prince is a likely candidate, but it's, it's not impossible. And he was an advisor, informal advisor last time. He wrote a memo uh, calling for, you know, this thing that uh, Soleimani, the Iranian general, should be assassinated. It, he yeah. wrote that. He sent it to Steve Bannon. It was passed around to others. I Flynn, I'm almost sure. I, I'm not going to say that that was the uh you know triggered the assassination but it went into the thinking and it you know i'm sure it was part of the thinking that led to the assassination of Soleimani. um so the guy is a big deal he's rich he funds right-wing causes right-wing movements right-wing politicians um and politically influential wealthy and in part of at the center of a network of u.s and global extreme rightists who are capable of doing a lot of damage, in my opinion. And that is what makes it important. A lot of the people in the group aren't, you, you won't know their names. Some of them, in my opinion, are more dangerous than yeah. there are two members, current members of Congress. There are current government officials. You know, it, it's not just like retirees. There are a bunch of people who still work for the government. Mark Green of the House Freedom Caucus from Tennessee is in the group. Ryan Zinke. Yeah who's now a member of Congress from Montana and was Trump's Secretary of Interior until he White, was White fish is a whole thing that, that whole yeah. thing. Wow. A weird, yeah. weird world. So, you know, it's, to me, it's a, a genuinely important story that bears close attention and that I think is relevant to put let's put aside the question of voting i think people who are going to vote and who aren't sure i think it's relevant to like if you're thinking who am i going to support how am i going to vote you know and if you're concerned if one of your top concerns is domestic repression and a re you know like trump administration too <clears throat> you know does you know, is guilty of some of the excesses of Trump administration one, then I would be very concerned about what's in this group chat. Because there are people in this group chat who served in the Trump administration and there are people in May again and others who didn't, but May this time. So, yeah. I mean, Thank call, you, me, call, me, call me crazy, but I think I'm going to vote for the guy who doesn't have the war criminal mercenary warlord. <laughs> call me crazy. But... For people who are, you know, in Michigan or Florida, I think it's worth, you know, hey, again, I'm all, I'm biased. It's my story, but I think it's an important story and should be read uh, by people who are maybe thinking it may be a bridge too far for me to support Trump. You know, maybe he won't be crazy, but maybe he will. I think it's alarming. Uh, the Just evidence from this chat group is not encouraging about, uh, you know, these people revere Trump. I mean, the only like the only like they revered Trump more than anybody. They love Tucker. They love um, Eric Prince, you know, who's obviously created the group. But their hero is Donald Trump. And that is concerning, I think. So sounds Thank like a fascist so call. Thank you so thank you so much, Ken, for this incredibly brilliant interview and your bravery in doing this work. This is dangerous work. Investigative journalism generally is, but you're really, uh, you know, willing to actually go there. And I appreciate you very much. And I look forward to having you back on as these 
stories continue to unfold. Great, thank you. And please do show for my Substack where I'll be publishing most of these stories, or let me, as well as New Republic, which I'm you know, very grateful to for doing a great job yeah. publishing the story. And I hope people who haven't seen the story will check it out there, but also my Substack is called Washington Babylon. You could just Google my name and that and Substack and you'd find it, but it's Ken Silverstein, all one word, dot substack, dot com. And I'm going to have a piece up as soon as possible that I hope you all will read too, because it's got 20 more names and I'll be wow. publishing a lot of stories there. So fabulous, uh, fabulous tease. And um, all right. Thank you. Wow. Thank fabulous. you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again, Ken. Take care.